Well, good morning, Fairfax. Happy Sunday. It's awesome to be with you. I am Kayla. And I am Raj. Good morning. Good morning, Kayla. <laughs> what is today? Today is Father's Day, but you know, my, yeah, so yeah, let's have a round of applause. Happy Father's Day. (laughs) I hope that your kids remembered. My kids were kind of waking up and and I think they they reminded each other, hey, it's Father's Day. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so um, first, fathers, happy Father's Day. And I'm, I am not used to giving announcements and talking in front of people. So give me a second here. I'm going to use my notes here. All right. So, hey, happy Father's Day. If you're here online, uh, you know, online or in person, if you came in and you saw that backdrop to take photos with, please do that. Like, take a photo. If you're anything like me, I hate being in photos. I hate being in front of people here right now. Um, and I'll tell you what, dads, um, you've got to get more photos with your kids. So use this as an opportunity to get a photo with your children. This is as good as it gets, dads. You're not going to get any younger. So get yourself on, you know, on, on camera right now. And hey, uh, summer groups are still open. You can still join a group, connect, get connected. Um, in, a, one of the, you know, in the summer groups, we have men's groups, women's groups, groups for young adults and for students. You can sign up online. And then parents of preschool age children, I am, I'm so glad I'm not a parent of preschool children. You once were. I once was. Now they're all teenagers and that's a whole different set of problems. Um, You're invited to join Fairfax Kids uh, for Clubhouse Fun Days. Join us for eight Wednesday mornings from July 13th to August 31st. Each week has a different theme for the kids. And this year we've created a space for parents to connect, like get a coffee, read a book. Again, you can sign up online. Now over to you. Okay. Thank you, Raj. Um, So the next announcement is the trellis program. So for those of you that don't know, we are a host church for something called the trellis program, which equips young leaders who are looking to go into ministry. So for those of you that know Izzy Hollenbeck, who's amazing, you've seen her on this stage. She is a trellis intern. So she is simultaneously going to school, pursuing her undergrad degree, and she's working in ministry. So if she's you, 19 years old. Isn't that she's awesome? 19 years old. <laughs> She's amazing. If I had been that amazing at 19, who knows where I would be. (laughs) Um, But if you know somebody, if you are somebody who's young, you're about to graduate high school, and you feel like you have God's call in your life, you have a sense of pulling you into ministry, and you are interested in learning more about that, definitely look at our website, check that out. We are accepting more interns. So if you know somebody who'd be interested in that program, um, definitely go online and check that out. The last announcement is actually a, an ask for worship leaders, specifically male worship leaders. So we have an amazing, amazing team here. Raj has been part of that team for what, three years? Yeah, and you've done an amazing and, job. And so, yeah, just to speak to that. So I'm in the military, so my orders have come out to, you know, to get to the next, next station. I know a lot of you are in public service and, it, and it, uh, I think sometimes we get scared that, I can't get involved in church because it'll take too much time. It will, it will drain me. Um, I have barely enough time already, but I'll tell you, being part of this community, being part of this team um, has been so fulfilling. It makes me a better father, husband, certainly a better public servant. Um, because, and so I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, uh, what talent you have. I was on camera today, so you can, you can plug in just about anywhere on the worship team and help um, contribute, be a producer, um, and switch, I think. In your spiritual life, you can switch from that being a consumer to being a producer. And I yeah. just want to encourage all of you to do that in some way. So yeah, keep going. Kate. Yeah, we'll miss you dearly. Yeah, but... I, I got two more Sundays. So I'm, I'm looking forward to these last two Sundays. Yeah. yeah. The last thing that I have for you guys is giving. So this place, we run 100% off of your generosity and we are so, so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that. We practice um, the biblical, biblical principle of the tithe here and that just really involves really giving back to God what is his. Everything that we have, we consider that it has come from the Lord. And that is no different with our finances. Um, If you're like me, I did not grow up in a household where we practiced that. Um, We very much lived paycheck to paycheck growing up. So that was a new principle for me, especially when I came into ministry. 
Um, and there was a particular season, I'm just taking this opportunity to embarrass Raj because he's right here. There was a particular season a couple of years ago where I was really struggling. I was dealing with all of the consequences of the way that I had been living prior and I was not handling my money well. And there was a particular season in my life where I did not know how I was gonna make ends meet. You know when just things just when it rains, it pours financially and there's something, there's all these unexpected things that come up and I was in that season and I didn't have anybody to go to and I didn't tell anyone that that was going on. And I had just met Raj literally a couple weeks earlier. We didn't really have a relationship or anything at that point. Um, and he, out of the goodness of his heart over Facebook said, here, my family and I, we've been budgeting this month and we have some money left over and I just felt the Lord say that this is for you. And I had never had anybody do something like that for me before. I was like, who the heck is this guy? He's crazy. Why would you just give money to somebody that you don't know? But he had no idea that the exact amount that he had given me was the exact amount that I had owed. Yeah. And I just wanna share that with you guys because um, I was reading Matthew 6 at the time and it talks about how you just don't worry because if God takes care of the birds and he takes care of the lilies and he takes care of all of these things, how much more important are you to him than those things? So don't worry about the future. Don't worry about what's gonna happen and God is gonna provide. I feel like sometimes we get into this mode, even as Christians, where we look at our finances the same way that the rest of the world does. And we look at it as just this thing, as this transaction, as this part of culture, but it is just like every other part of your life where it's an opportunity for you to see God move and for you to see him bring heaven to earth. So I just wanted to share that with you guys this morning. And if you would, let's just bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful for the way that you provide for us. We're so grateful that you care for us in the way that you do, God, and that no amount um, that we give up, no amount that we need, God, there's nothing that we could ever do to pay you back for what you've done for us on the cross. And we're just so grateful for the way that you watch over our lives, for the way that you are so intentional and for the way that you move in the lives of others to show us that you are real, that you are present, and that you are in all things, including our finances. God, I pray this morning, God, that you would just open our hearts wide open to hear a word from you fresh and new as Rod preaches the message this morning, God, that that we would have soft and malleable hearts that are ready to receive what you have for us this morning, God. I pray that you would clear all of the distractions, you would clear everything from our minds so we could focus on you and your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So I wanna make one other acknowledgement uh, today. Uh, David Martinez um, was one of our fellows, and uh, he was here. Uh, he came in 2020. We brought two uh, fellows. Uh, they're part of our fellowship program, which is another program that raises up a new generation of leaders. And David was uh, one of two that came from Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, and uh, Yvonne was the other. And they came uh, in January of 2020, early 2020, and uh, had this wonderful plan in mind of what they were gonna do. They were gonna be here six months and they were gonna go to South Africa. And it was gonna be an amazing year. And then three weeks after they came, or four weeks after they came, uh, COVID hit and pretty much everything shut down and uh, all their plans kind of went uh, awry and they had to stay in the country. They couldn't go back to their country. They couldn't leave this country. They couldn't, nobody wanted them or would allow them to leave, right? So we wanted them so bad they wouldn't, they couldn't leave and no one, you know, it's just like no one could travel South Africa, nothing. And so they stayed here for six months and they stayed here for a year and they applied for extensions. They did everything everything right, all of that. And then they got to the end of that year and the fellowship was, uh, was run out, their time on their tourist visa had run out. And uh, David, we had become convinced that God was calling David to come on staff here at Fairfax. And so we began work. He went back uh, home to Buenos Aires. He started helping us uh, from Buenos Aires. And uh, and we began to work on his R1 visa. And you know, the thing about the government that I love is that they do things ev so, so quickly. And uh, 
So whatever you do, like it's just going to happen like that. And, uh, uh, and that's not to make fun. I know half of you work for the government, so I'm not making fun. I just, I'm just saying it takes a long time. And so it's been a long journey, a long process. But all that to say is that this Friday, David got back here and is here today for the first time. So, David, welcome. We're welcome back. We are so glad that you are here. And David is on staff in our communications uh, department and our uh, creative arts department and just a tremendous addition uh, to this place. Uh, before I jump in to the message, let, let me just offer a prayer. Let's bow our heads. God, uh, we uh, celebrate dads today. We're thankful for uh, the role that... Um, that some of us have been entrusted with, the stewardship that some of us have been given, and uh, what an amazing, amazing responsibility it is. And uh, I thank you for every dad that's a part of this place, and whether they're here today or they're part of uh, worshiping online or whatever it is, Lord, we're just so thankful for them. We pray that they sense your presence in the midst of whatever the challenges are that they are going through, uh, that they're facing, whether it has to do with uh, family things or financial things or work things or whatever it is, Lord, we pray that you would just work and that you would, uh, yeah, that they would sense uh, your glorious hand upon them as they carry out the task that you have entrusted uh, to them. Uh, Lord, on June, uh, on June 19th, we, we celebrate today, Juneteenth, even though we know it's a holiday, we celebrate it tomorrow, but uh, Lord, we continue to um, reflect on our past and repent for anything and systems and people that, uh, that enslave and that keep us from being uh, what we were created to be, and we give thanks for uh, decisions and movements and and uh, people and and uh, people in power and authority that have made different decisions and it's a different reality, Lord. Now and we celebrate that and we also uh, look forward to uh, just being able to continue to move in the direction in every area of life. Continue to move in the direction of freedom. And, uh, and to really bind the things and rebuke the things that enslave us. And Lord, we pray in this moment, as we open up your word in a really uh, passage that's so important but so misunderstood sometimes, Lord, we pray that you would just um, um, guide my words, uh, allow uh, me to say the things that reflect you and reflect this passage and reflect your heart. And uh, we pray this in the name of Christ. And everybody said, amen. All right, so we're in the seventh week of this Ephesians series. Uh, two weeks away, or one week away. Okay, next week is the final week of the series. It's been an eight-week series. It's been amazing. been a great journey as we've gone through the book of Ephesians. Today, today we're looking at the second part of Ephesians 5. And it's all about, the second part of Ephesians 5 is all about marriage. It's all about relationships. And, and the first thing I want to say before we really get into the passage, I want to set a little context for the passage because uh, one, this is one of the most, as I said in my prayer, one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible. Uh, and there's several reasons for that. One is that on the surface, it seems to paint a picture, seems to, seems to paint a picture on the surface of husband-wife relationships that are very much the product of the first century culture in which Paul lived. Uh, the second reason is because it's hard to read a passage like this, and this is true with so many passages of scripture. It's hard to read a passage like this and not read it through your own experiential filters, like whatever you have experienced in life. So if you've been in a not so awesome marriage or you're the product of parents that were in a not so awesome marriage uh, where some of these texts were abused in some way, then you may hear a passage like this or read a passage like this and just kind of recoil at the very language that is used. 
And the reverse is true as well. If you were in, if you're in an awesome marriage or you were the product of uh, parents who had a really awesome marriage, then you may be a little naive about how some of these texts, if they're used to manipulate and control how some of these texts can be so significantly damaging in a relationship. So a lot of this is about the filters that we look at this stuff through. And the third reason is because this text is often read by starting at verse 22 rather than starting at verse 21. Because verse 21 is actually the heart of the passage. And this is what it says, Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Three key focuses there. First it says, answer your phone. Make sure you answer your phone when you call in church. And uh, no, I'm busy right now. He's talking about submission. Okay, I'll talk later. And uh, all right, so submit. Three different points. I like submit. That's like, we're gonna talk about that. To one another. And we're gonna talk about what does that mean and the implications of that on everything else that is said. Submit to one another, to each other, to each other, out of reverence for Christ. Like, what does that mean? Like, out of reverence for Christ. Now, that verse is right in the middle of two different themes that Paul is addressing in this part of his letter to the Ephesians. In verses 18 through 20, which we looked at last week, Paul talks about the importance of every believer being filled with the Spirit. And just to kind of remind you, this is what he said. This is the passage that leads in to verse 21 that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing, make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then verse 22 through verse 25 or through 33, Paul talks about marriage. Now, it's easy to look at all of that and think that Paul is talking about three separate things here. That he's, first of all, he's talking about being filled with the Spirit. And then he's talking about submitting to one another. And then he's talking about marriage. It has kind of three themes here. Well, first, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Then I want to talk about submitting to each other. And then I want to talk about you know, marriage and relationships and all of that. But remember, in the original letter that Paul wrote, there are no chapter designations. There are no verse designations. There are no nice category headings that say, okay, this passage is about marriage relationships and this passage is about the Holy Spirit and all that. There's none of that. Those were all added later to help people kind of find specific passages better to identify themes. And most of the time, those designations are helpful. But sometimes they cause us to disconnect things that should not be disconnected. And that's certainly true in this passage. Paul is not saying that being filled with the Spirit is important and submitting to um, one another out of reverence to Christ is important and a good marriage is important. He's saying that all of those three, being filled with the Holy Spirit, submitting to one another, good marriage, all of those three are like inextricably connected. He's saying that being filled with the Holy Spirit will create a community where people are submitting to one another and a community where people are submitting to one another will result in marriages that are characterized by that same submission, that same mutual submission. In other words, when this is the thing is sometimes people go like, okay, connect the dots here because it really doesn't make sense the way that we interpret this sometimes. Paul is saying when two Christians get married, they don't all of a sudden stop submitting to each other. Paul is, doesn't say, he doesn't say to husbands and wives, you know, that, you know that this mutual submission stuff that I just talked about, you know how I just talked about mutual submission that you are to submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus? If you get married, you can forget all that that I just said. Like, you can forget all of that. That doesn't apply to you anymore. Now just one of you has to submit. No, he's saying you are still in this relationship 
of mutual submission, that that is the relationship between two people who are followers of Jesus, whether they are married to each other or not. Now, the reason that's so important to understand is that most of the time, the cultural view of marriage, what, whatever the culture is, the cultural view of marriage is focused on what can this other person do for me. It's actually fairly self-centered. Like, how can this other person fulfill me? In more traditional cultures that see marriage as primarily about fulfilling certain social obligations, like producing children or providing financial security or determining one's status in, or standing in the culture, it's about how can my spouse help me to accomplish those things, to fulfill those things. And in cultures that have a more romantic view of marriage, kind of Western modern cultures that have more romantic view of marriage, where marriage is more about love and passion and intimacy, it's still the same thing. It's about how can my spouse help me fulfill those things? Different cultures, same expectations. How can this other person help me fulfill this stuff? But Paul lays out a very different view of marriage, a view of marriage that has a very different, radically countercultural view of marriage, a very radically countercultural, different purpose. Paul is saying that a Christ centered marriage is not primarily about how my spouse can fulfill me. It's about how can I join with God in helping to fulfill what God is doing in the life of my spouse. Paul is painting a picture of uh, something that is the exact opposite of a utilitarian relationship. A utilitarian relationship is all about how can this person help me? How can this person help me accomplish whatever it is that I want to accomplish. Washington, D.C. is filled with utilitarian relationships. That's what we do in Washington, D.C. It's about utilitarian relationships. So many relationships revolve around the idea of how can this person, so much of our networking, our connectedness, all of that revolves around the idea of how can this person help me accomplish whatever it is that I want to accomplish. And as long as that person is helpful to me, I maintain the relationship. But when that person is no longer helpful to me, then the priority of that relationship goes down, sometimes becomes non-existent. And Paul is saying that marriage, marriage, the marriage relationship is different than that. In fact, he's saying that every relationship that is Christ-centered is different than that. He's saying that marriage is about submitting to one another, not about using one another. And submitting to one another and using one another are two very, very different things. Now, let's dig into what Paul actually specifically says to husbands and wives. And I just want you to hang on. Because it may sound harsh at first, but as I said before, it's actually cultural bound language that has been radically, radically, radically redefined by Paul. This is what he says. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22, we'll start with. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, or as the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. Or we are members, for we are members of his body. 
For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, let's unpack that just a little bit. Really powerful passage where Paul is saying some really radically countercultural things. First thing I want you to notice is that husbands and wives don't get the same verbs here. And that's what I think a lot of times throws us off as we read this passage. Husbands are instructed to love, wives are instructed to submit and respect. And the reality is that doesn't mean that husbands don't have to submit and respect and that wives don't have to love their husbands. I mean, Paul has just said in verse 21, he's just said, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are to submit to one another. And as I said before, the command to mutually submit doesn't just magically go away because a a, a fellow believer goes from being your friend to going to being your spouse. It just kind of magically go away. Also, the New Testament is filled with references. If you read through the Gospels, you read through the, the words of Jesus, you read through the writings of Paul, you read through the New Testament, it's filled with references of how we are to love each other how we are to respect each other. Jesus says the greatest command is to love our neighbor. The greatest command is to love others. That doesn't just magically go away because we marry a person. A wife can't say, you have to love me, but according to Paul, I don't have to love you. You have to uh, respect me. A husband can't say, you have to respect me, but I don't have to respect you. You Like that flies in the face of the whole witness of Scripture. So then, why does Paul use different verbs with husbands and wives? Basically what he's doing is using traditional words and investing them with radically new meaning. In Paul's culture, there was definitely... Now all the words that he uses were common in Paul's culture. He didn't like invent these words... And people who heard them said, oh, I never heard of that concept before. I never heard of that word before. No, in Paul's culture, all these words were used. And in Paul's culture, there was definitely an expectation for men to love their wives in the sense of like basic provision, basic provision for their wife. But it was primarily a societal duty and had very little to do with the health of the relationship. Like it, like when you heard the word love in that culture, it was, it was about like a certain kind of duty that I fulfill. It wasn't about the dynamic health of the relationship. And there was definitely an expectation in this culture, in Paul's culture, there was definitely an expectation that wives would respect and submit to their husbands. Like he didn't invent that term. That would have been very common in culture, but it was a submission that was forced. It was a submission that was controlling. It basically meant that the wife was the property of the husband and that the husband had complete and total control in the relationship. And Paul takes all of that, all of those words, love, submission, respect, headship, as we're gonna talk about in a moment. He takes all of those words and he just turns them upside down. He takes the word submit. And he redefines it to be putting the needs of your spouse ahead of your own needs. That it's not a culturally forced submission. It's not a husband demanding submission. It's a voluntary submission like the church, like you submit to Christ. Like your submit, Paul is saying, the submission I'm talking about is like the submission that you have to Jesus, where you decide to make that decision to submit yourself to Christ. In fact, going back to verse 21, Paul says that this is a submission that flows out of reverence for Christ. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now the word reverence there means fear, but fear in the Bible is not about being afraid 
of what God is going to do to you. It's about an awe-inspired amazement of who God is and what God has done. Now, I want you to notice that Paul doesn't say submit to one another out of reverence for one another. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying, I want you to submit to one another because you are filled with amazement for this other person. No, Paul is saying, I want you to submit to one another because you are filled with amazement with Christ. Filled with amazement at what Christ has done for you on the cross. Filled with amazement of how Christ has submitted himself to you filled with amazement of how Christ has put your needs ahead of his needs. I want you to submit to one another because you are filled with absolute amazement at what Jesus has done in your own life. In other words, don't look at your husband and your wife or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or anybody else in your life Don't look at them as your savior. Like don't place on these relationships the expectation that this relationship, this relationship with my husband or my wife, my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my friend or the person that like speaks to me like that, this person is going to somehow be my savior. Don't place on these relationships the expectation that this relationship is going to make you acceptable, that this relationship is going to give your life purpose and meaning, that this relationship is going to fulfill you in every way. Because if you do, it will crush the other person and it will crush, eventually crush the relationship because you will be placing on that relationship and that person an expectation that only Jesus can fulfill. Now, this is not easy stuff. This is hard stuff. It's hard to put the needs of someone else ahead of your own. Especially if, especially if you're not sure that the other person whether that's your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your friend, whatever, if you're not sure that you can trust that the other person is going to put your needs ahead of theirs, like it puts you in a very vulnerable spot and it's really challenging to do. And this is where most relationship breakdowns, where most marriages break down is that, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I'm willing to put this person's need ahead of my own, but I don't know that I trust that they are going to do the same, that they are going to put my needs ahead of theirs. So this is like really, really tough stuff, which is why, Paul is saying, which is why reverence for Christ is so essential because it's reverence for Christ. It's amazement in what Christ has done for you on the cross that allows you to live this incredibly vulnerable life of submission. Because when the most important relationship in your life is with someone who loves you so much that they laid their life down for you, then you can risk being vulnerable in doing the same. In the same way Paul redefines submission, he also redefines headship. He says that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, this headship is not about power. It's not about control, which was definitely the reality in Paul's day. It's about sacrificial love. Paul redefines headship to not being about controlling or being over someone. There's no hierarchy in this kind of headship. There's no hierarchy in a marriage. You can't define the marriage relationship with an org chart. That's the problem, is that sometimes we look at this and we try to define the marriage relationship with an org chart. Paul says that marriage is this divine mystery, this mystery that refuses to be defined by hierarchies. It refuses to be defined by an org chart. Look at, again at verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united 
to his wife and the two will become one, one flesh. Paul says that marriage is this mystery where two become one. And when Paul talks about one flesh, he's not just talking about physical oneness, he's talking about spiritual oneness as well. And there is no hierarchy in oneness. Paul Paul develops this idea of like what oneness is and what headship is. He develops it in another context, dealing with some other issues that are cultural issues that are going on in the church at Corinth. But then in the midst of all of that that he is addressing, he He says this about headship that kind of helps to clarify it in many respects. It's in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And first of all, you read that, and maybe for some you recoil and go, oh, I'm not sure about that. But what he's saying here, he's saying that man, talking about the husband, is the head of the woman, talking about the wife, in the same way that God... (laughs) is the head of Christ. He's comparing the headship in marriage to the headship in the Trinity. He's comparing the mystery of marriage to the mystery of the Trinity. And there is no hierarchy in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. They cannot be, you cannot define the Trinity with an org chart. You cannot define the Trinity in some hierarchical system. Like you cannot, the Father, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, Scripture just reminds us of this throughout Scripture, are one. The other thing I want you to notice is that Paul doesn't say anything, anything about roles. Like there's nothing here about wives taking on certain roles and husbands taking on certain roles. It doesn't say anything about who should do the cooking, who should do the laundry, who should mow the lawn, who should work outside the home, who should take off when the kids are sick. It doesn't say anything about those tasks. It doesn't say where those tasks should be divided up, where they should be split up, or where those tasks should be shared, you do them together, or whether you should get some help from someone else to get some of that stuff done. It doesn't say anything about that. He doesn't say anything. Now, by not addressing those things, Paul is saying without actually having to say it. Sometimes Paul says some things without actually having to say it. He's saying that when you love each other, when you respect each other, when you submit to each other, you will figure all of that out based on the dynamics of your unique relationship and the unique gifts and passions and talents and abilities that each of you possess. And then finally, Paul takes the word love and just turns it on its head. He takes the word love and just completely and totally redefines it. He defines it as not just being about provision, not just about some fulfilling some basic societal expectation or norm. He says that it too is about putting the needs of the other person ahead of your own. Paul defines love as loving the way that Christ loved us. Look again at verse 25 and following. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. And Paul says, if you want to know what a marriage looks like, what love in a marriage looks like, if you want to know what love in any relationship looks like, just look at Jesus. Paul says that Jesus loves us with this lay down your life Love at all costs. Give yourself away. Kind of love. 
And then he says something that I think we forget when we read this passage. He says that Jesus' desire is to present us to himself as radiant, without stain or wrinkle or blemish. In other words, Jesus' desire, Paul is saying, is to make us beautiful. That's his desire. Is that what it means for Jesus to love us is to have this lay down your life, Whatever it takes, I'm willing to sacrifice for you. But it's, it's, it's more than that. It's this desire to make the other beautiful. To allow the other to become something that they would not be able to become without experiencing that kind of love. See, out of his great love for us, Jesus doesn't just see us the way we are. (laughs) Wow. I'm so thankful for that. He does see us the way we are. He knows us. He knows everything about us, but he doesn't just see us the way we are. He also sees us the way God created us to be. The way that we can be. Jesus sees the potential in us. Jesus sees the beauty in us, even when we're not beautiful. He sees the beauty in us. And Paul is saying, that's the same kind of love that God calls you to have for your wife or for your husband or for your kids or for your friend. He calls you to have this lay down your life kind of love. But he also calls you to see your wife or your husband or your kids or your friend, not just as they are, but as God created them to be. He calls you to see the potential in them. He calls you to see the beauty in them even when they are not beautiful even when they don't feel very beautiful even when they don't act very beautiful he calls you to see the beauty in that person God we repent today for where we sometimes fall so enormously short of loving others the way that you have loved us. We give you thanks for a love that knows no bounds, a love that is willing to lay down its life for us a love that sees the potential in us, that sees us not just for who we are, but who we can become in Christ. And Lord, if there is someone here today or someone watching online or part of our online worshiping community and and they just never experienced that love, I pray that today would be the day to say yes to what you've done for them on the cross and yes for your forgiveness and yes to the beauty that you want to bring into all of our lives. And Lord, we pray that we, filled with the Holy Spirit, because we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do this, that we, filled with the Holy Spirit, would love in the same way that we would be willing to lay down our lives for the people you have put in our life and that we would see the potential and the beauty that is in every single one of them in the name of Jesus we pray amen let's stand together worship